Hello, today in Nagorno, today we're going to be solving May June 2022, paper 1, variant 1. And before we start, I'd highly appreciate it if you would take a moment and subscribe to this channel and like this video. And before we start, we are offering free topic 1 notes. All you have to do is fill in the form in the description box down below. We are also selling topic 2 notes, which include all the tips, tricks of paper 1, and common misconceptions with worth examples too. Upon purchase, you can ask us unlimited number of questions about the topic or past paper questions for free and you're able to exclusively contact us at any time which is a new and unique service we also have another monthly service which you can ask us unlimited number of questions and past paper questions for the full as biology syllabus only for 15 dollars per month question number one a student uses a stage micrometer scale to calibrate an ip's graticule the diagram shows the view of both the stage micrometer scale and the eyepiece graticule seen by these students. The divisions on the scale micrometer scale are 0.1 mm apart. The student removed the stage micrometer scale and viewed a slide with blood cells on it. The same lenses were used so that the magnification remained unchanged. The student measured the diameter of one of the white blood cells on the slide using the eyepiece graticule and recorded that it was 8 eyepiece units. What is the correct diameter of this white blood cell in micrometers? Now, here it's telling us that the stage micrometer scale are 0.1 millimeters apart. Converting it to micrometers, this means that each single one of them is going to be 100 micrometers. Now, here, for every 100 micrometers on the stage micrometer, we have 40 eyepiece graticule units covering it. Don't be confused, it's 40, not 50. Therefore, what do we do to calculate the size of one IPs graticule? We do this by 100 divided by 40. So 100 divided by 40 gives us 2.5 micrometers for one IPs graticule unit. And here it's telling us that it was 8 IPs units. Therefore, what we do is multiply 2.5 by 8, and this gives us 20, and the answer is going to be C. Question number 2. Four students were asked to match the function with the appearance of some cell structures in an animal cell. The functions were listed by number. Which student correctly matched the numbered function with the appearance of the cell structure? Now, let's start with 1. mRNA passes through to the ribosome. As we all know, mRNA leaves the nucleus via the nuclear envelope. containing many pores to allow so. Therefore, here we are looking for the nuclear envelope, and we have the choices between V and X. Let's see V. Membranes which surround an enclosed inner cavity. This is incorrect. This is not the nuclear envelope. This is most likely the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now, for X, it's going to be a double membrane interspersed with pores. As we all know, the nuclear envelope is a double membrane and it does have pores to allow the movement of substances in and out the nucleus. Therefore, X is correct. For two, produces the mitotic spindle during cell division. As we all know, what produces the spindle is the centrioles. Therefore, here we have a choice between W or Y. For W, non-membrane bound spherical structures. So the non-membrane bound spherical structures are going to be ribosomes because actually centrioles are covered by a membrane. Now, so W is incorrect. Let's look at why non-membrane bound cylindrical structures. These are microtubules. Therefore, this is correct because centrioles are made of microtubules. Therefore, Y is correct. For three, packaging of hydrolytic enzymes that will remain in the cell. As we all know, the packaging and modifying of proteins are by Golgi body. Therefore, here we have a choice between Y and Z. So Y, we know it was the centrioles, so this is incorrect. And Z, membrane-bound sacs arranged as a flattened stack. So Golgi body under an electron microscope will look something like this arranged as stacks over each other, almost like coins. Therefore, Z is going to be the correct answer, and the answer is going to be D. Number three, 
which size range would include most prokaryotic cells? Now, I've written here prior that size range for prokaryotic cells is between 0.1 to 5 micrometers. Therefore, the only correct answer must be B. Question number four, what is present in a typical prokaryotic cell and a typical eukaryotic cell? Now, 70S ribosomes. This is correct because prokaryotic cells have 70S ribosomes in the cytoplasm and eukaryotic cells have them inside mitochondria and chloroplasts. Therefore, this is correct for B. Centrioles. As we all know that prokaryotic cells don't have any membrane-bound organelles and centrioles are membrane-bound organelles. Therefore, this is incorrect. It's not present in prokaryotic cells. For C, circular DNA in the cytoplasm. Okay, because here it's specified in the cytoplasm, therefore this is not present in eukaryotic cells because in eukaryotic cells, the circular DNA is inside the chloroplast in the mitochondria. It's not inside the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, we have the normal linear DNA inside the nucleus. Therefore, this is incorrect for the starch granules. Prokaryotic cells do not have starch granules. Therefore, this is incorrect. And the answer is going to be A. Question number five, which statement about viruses is correct? A, they all have a capsid made of protein. Of course, this is correct because all viruses, all viruses must have capsid made of protein. Therefore, this is correct. It's a vital component of viruses. B, they all contain RNA. This is incorrect. Why? Because viruses con could contain either RNA or DNA, but both of them could not be present together in the same virus. Be aware. Therefore, this is incorrect for C. They all have an outer envelope made of phospholipids. Now, this is incorrect. The reason for this is that the outer envelope of the virus is determined by the host cell membrane. So it depends on which host cell the virus has infected. Therefore, this is not always the correct case. Therefore, C is incorrect. For D, they all contain 70S ribosomes. Viruses never ever have ribosomes because they cannot synthesize their own proteins. And that's why in the first place, they have to infect host cells to be able to replicate. Therefore, this is incorrect and the correct answer is going to be A. Question number six, samples of glucose, sucrose, and a mixture of glucose and sucrose were divided into two halves, M and N. M was then tested with Benedict's solution. Benedict's solution is a test for reducing sugars and a positive test will be from blue to brick red. N was boiled with dilute hydrochloric acid. Now, dilute hydrochloric acid is used to break the glycosidic bond of a disaccharide of a non-reducing sugar in order to form a reducing sugar. And this is their test for non-reducing sugars. Neutralized and then tested with Mendix solution. The color of the solution was compared to color standards, which table identifies the correct color changes for these samples. Now, let's first start with glucose. As we all know, M was tested with Benedict's solution. Therefore, because glucose is a reducing sugar, then the solution would turn from blue to brick red. Here we have yellow, so this is correct. Same with here and here. Here in question number eight, it's assuming that glucose did not have a positive test with Benedict's solution, and this is incorrect because it is a reducing sugar. Now, let's move on to sucrose. Now, sucrose would have a negative test just with Benedict's solution without breaking the glycosidic bond. Therefore, it would stay blue. So this is correct, this is correct, and all of them are correct. Now, for the mixture, because we know the mixture has both glucose and sucrose, this means that it's also going to have a positive test with Benedict's solution because it partially has glucose. Therefore, it must change color to yellow. It cannot stay blue because as we said it's a mixture therefore a and b are incorrect now let's move on to n n is the test for non-reducing sugars now for glucose here we have yellow and yellow this is correct because even with dilute hydrochloric acid there is no more reducing sugar in the sample therefore it would stay the same color the color concentration would not change. Therefore, this is correct. Now, for D, here it's assuming that somehow when the test for non-reducing sugars here was carried out, that the solution turned from yellow to red. This means that 
in and there was a higher non there was a higher reducing sugar concentration now this is incorrect because both of them would stay the same there will not be any change therefore d is incorrect and the answer is going to be c question number seven which molecules contain one to four glycosidic bonds now amylose contains alpha one to four glycosidic bonds so this is correct Cellulose contains beta 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds, and this is correct. And glycogen both contains alpha 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds and alpha 1 to 6 glycosidic bonds. So all three are correct, and the answer is going to be C. Question number 8. The diagram shows three triglycerides, X, Y, and Z. Which row is correct for these triglycerides? Now, contains saturated fatty acids. As you can see here, all of them contain saturated fatty acids. And all these three are saturated. Therefore, these are going to be correct A and B. Now, it contains unsaturated fatty acids. As you can see here, the kinks. This means that both X and Y contains unsaturated fatty acids. So X and Y are correct. And then contains more than two different fatty acids. Also, X and Y contains more than two different fatty acids. They are not the same. Therefore, the answer is going to be A. Question number nine. Some foods contain hydrogenated vegetable fats. These are unsaturated fats that have been converted to saturated. Which property of fats have changed? Now, as you all know, unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature, such as oils, for example. And saturated fats are solid at room temperature, such as butter. Now, Let's start with A, their hydrocarbon chains will fit together more loosely. This is correct, because if it turned from liquid to solid, then their hydrocarbon chains will fit closer together. Now for B, their solubility in water will increase. Solubility here is not altered. The reason for this is that we all know that fats are non-polar molecules, so all of them are insoluble. See, they will have more double bonds in their molecules. No, actually, this is not true. They will, they will have less double bonds in their molecules. The reason for this is it's said because it turned from unsaturated to saturated. Usually, unsaturated fats have more double bonds than saturated. Therefore, this is incorrect. D. They will remain liquid at room temperature. No, they would remain solid. Therefore, this is incorrect and the answer is going to be A. 10. A polypeptide contains a specific number of amino acids N. How many peptide bonds are present in this polypeptide? Now I'll show you an example to make it more clear. Here let's assume we have four amino acids. In order to link those four amino acids together, we need one, two, and three peptide bonds. Let's see another example. Here we have five amino acids. In order to link these five amino acids, we need to link them by one, two, three, and four peptide bonds. So for four amino acids, we need three peptide bonds. And for five amino acids, we need four peptide bonds. Therefore, the answer is going to be A. We need one less peptide bonds than the amino acids present. Number 11, which statement is correct? A. Amylase, ribose, and phospholipid are all macromolecules. Now, amylase is correct, it's a macromolecule because it's an enzyme. Now, for ribose, this is incorrect because, as we all know, there's something in RNA nucleotide called a ribose sugar. It's the sugar component or the pentose sugar of an RNA nucleotide. Therefore, it's made of five carbon atoms and it's definitely not a macromolecule, so it's incorrect. For B, cellulose, glucose, and catalase are all polymers. Now, as we said, glucose is a monomer, it's not a polymer, it's a monosaccharide. Therefore, this is incorrect. See, deoxyribose, fructose, and ribose are all monosaccharides. Now, deoxyribose is the sugar component found in DNA nucleotides. As we said, ribose is found in RNA nucleotides, and deoxyribose are found in DNA nucleotides. Therefore, it's a sugar component and it's made of five carbon atoms. So it's correct, it's a monosaccharide for fructose. Yes, it is also a monosaccharide. And ribose is also the sugar component of RNA nucleotides. So this is correct, they are all three monosaccharides and the answer is going to be C. Now for D, sucrose, 
deoxyribose and amylopectin are all polysaccharides. Now sucrose is a disaccharide, therefore it's incorrect and the answer is going to be C. Question number 12. A student used colorimetry to monitor the hydrolysis of a protein by a protease enzyme. The student used a burette solution to determine the concentration of protein in the hydrolysis reaction. The student produced a calibration curve using known concentrations of protein. Which diagram shows the calibration curve? Now you have to know the root of the reaction that we have here. Here, burette solution would give a positive result with protein and it would turn from blue to purple. Therefore, as the protein concentration increases, the absorbance of the coloring meter also increases. Therefore, here it says which diagram shows the calibration curve. Here we have two things. And the question is trying to confuse you because here it's telling you the hydrolysis of, of a protein. So here the students will assume that the protein concentration is decreasing, but actually the experiment is separate to the calibration curve. Therefore, do not be tricked. Now, for the calibration curve here, it says increasing protein concentration. Therefore, as the protein concentration increases, this means that the purple color concentration also increases. Therefore, what happens is that the absorbance of that purple color also increases. Therefore, the answer is going to be B. And here it says transmission. Transmission means if the transmission co concentration increases, this means that the solution is starting to turn colorless. And this is incorrect because here it says the protein concentration is increasing. Therefore, the transmission would decrease, not increase, because the purple color concentration increases. Now here, for C and D, they are totally incorrect because here it's not measuring the rate of the reaction, it's measuring the transmission, and there's no such thing as transmission increases or decreasing, same with the absorbance. Therefore, the answer is going to be B. Question number 13. A student completed an experiment to measure how increasing concentrations of a substrate affects the rate of an enzyme-catalyzed reaction. The student then repeated the experiment after adding a fixed quantity of a reversible competitive inhibitor. Which row describes the effect of a reversible competitive inhibitor on the enzyme activity? Now we must first start by identifying what's a competitive inhibitor. So a competitive inhibitor binds to the active site of the enzyme competing with the substrate. Therefore, what happens is that the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate decreases because now there's a competitive inhibitor competing with the substrate present. So what happened is that the affinity decreases. And just a side note, if the affinity decreases, this means that the Km or Michael's Menten constant increases because they are inversely proportional. Now let's come back to our question. Here, attachment of inhibitor to the active site. Now, as you just said, competitive inhibitor binds to the active site, so this is correct. Then, effect of increasing substrate concentration on rate of enzyme-controlled reaction. Now, as you increase the substrate concentration, this outweighs the effect of the competitive inhibitor. Therefore, what happens is that the rate increases because the effect of the inhibitor has been outweighed. Now, this does not work with non-competitive inhibitor. With a non-competitive inhibitor, if you keep increasing substrate concentration, it has no effect. Therefore, this is why reversal, it's called a reversible competitive inhibitor because the action of the competitive inhibitor could be reversed. Therefore, the answer is going to be B. Question number 14, the diagram shows a liposome. Liposomes can be used to move therapeutic drugs into cells of the body to treat conditions such as cancer. Which row shows the property of a drug that could be transported in the sections of the liposome labeled 1 and 2? Now, in location 1 here, First of all, what we can see is a phospholipid bilayer with the hydrophilic phosphate head facing the outside and the inside and, and the hydrophobic core or the fatty acid tails facing to the inside. Therefore, it's very logical that the property of drug in location 1 is also going to be hydrophobic because this is where the hydrophobic core is located and the property of drug transported in location 2 is definitely going to also be hydrophilic because it has an action with the phosphate group. 
Therefore, this is going to be correct and the answer is going to be C. Question number 15. Some processes occurring in cells are listed. Which processes use ATP? Now, one, we have endocytosis and two, we have exocytosis. So both endocytosis and exocytosis require ATP because the movement of vesicles into or out of the cell also requires ATP. Therefore, endocytosis and exocytosis is correct. Now for three, facilitated diffusion. As we all know, facilitated diffusion is a passive process and it does not require ATP. It's called facilitated because substances diffuse through transport proteins such as carrier or channel proteins. That's it. So this is incorrect. Four, phagocytosis of dead cells by macrophages. So phagocytosis is a form of endocytosis. So this also requires ATP and the answer is therefore going to be B. Question number 16, the graph shows changes in the concentration of a solute inside a cell. What explains this change in concentration? Let's start with diffusion. Diffusion, obviously, if solute diffused out of the cell, this would decrease its concentration inside the cell. So this is correct. Now to endocytosis. Now endocytosis is not specifying what's entering the cell. It might be even more solute. Therefore, what happens is most likely it will not decrease the concentration of solute. It might actually increase it. Therefore, this is incorrect. Now three, exocytosis. So for exocytosis, the solute moves out, also lowering its concentration inside the cell. So this is correct. For four, osmosis. Now, there's a trick part here. Yes, osmosis is indirectly involved in decreasing the concentration of solute. Why, you'd ask? Because if water enters the cell, this means that now there is a higher water potential inside the cell. If there is more water inside the cell, this means that the solute concentration will start decreasing because there is a higher water potential. Therefore, this is correct and the answer is going to be B. 17. The indicator crystal red changes from red to yellow when put into acid. Which of the four blocks became completely yellow most quickly? So the one that became completely yellow most quickly is the one with the higher surface area to volume ratio. Now, ideally, you should always calculate the surface area to volume ratio and see which one is the largest. But we sometimes need to approach this question using our imagination or imagining the size of the blocks. Now, for example, for A, here, if you would imagine it, we would see a very flat block looking something like this. So logically, this would have the highest surface area to volume ratio. Contrasting B, for example, which would look something like a cube. Now, a cube looking like this would not have a higher surface area to volume ratio compared with the very flat surface of A. Same with C and with D2. Therefore, the correct answer must be A. Question number 18. Which processes require mitosis? 1. The cloning of T-lymphocyte. Of course, it requires mitosis. And T-lymphocyte are stimulated to divide by cytokines. 2. The repair of cell structures by protein synthesis. Here, it's specified that the cell structure is repaired by protein synthesis. Therefore, mitosis is not required in this case. Number two, cell structures are repaired by themselves and they do not require the division of cells. Therefore, this is incorrect. Three, the growth of multicellular organisms from a single cell. Here it says there was a single cell and now there was a growth from it of multicellular organisms. Therefore, the number of cells increased. Let's imagine. Therefore, definitely mitosis is involved in this. Therefore, this is incorrect, and a good example would be a zygote. For four, the reproduction of a unicellular eukaryote. Yes, the only way they divide or replicate is by mitosis. Therefore, one, three, and four is correct, and the answer is going to be B. Question number 19, which events listed are part of the cell cycle? Now, one interface, this is correct which includes G1, G2, and S phase, where DNA is replicated. For two, prophase. This is correct. Prophase is part of mitosis. Three, cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is also correct. It's the division of this cell, and it occurs after mitosis. Therefore, the answer is going to be A. Now, question number 20. Telomerase is an enzyme that adds nucleotides to telomeres. Which statements about telomerase is correct? Now, telomeres 
are sequences of non-coding DNA found at the end of the chromosomes to protect the chromosomes from gene loss and gene shortening. Now let's start with A. A high concentration of telomerase in a cell damages genes during DNA replication. No, this is incorrect. It actually protects genes and prevents its loss. For B. A high concentration of telomerase in cancerous cells limits the rate of tumor growth. Actually, this is incorrect. The high concentration of telomerase is the primary reason why the rate of tumor growth actually increases in the body. Therefore, this is incorrect. See, the low concentration of telomerase in stem cells means that they are, these cells can divide an unlimited number of times. This is incorrect because stem cells actually have a high concentration of telomerase and stem cells can divide unlimited number of times because it has a high concentration of telomerase. Therefore, this is incorrect. D. The low concentration of telomerase in body cells means that these cells can divide a limited number of times. This is correct because the lower concentration of telomeres in the body, this means that they can divide uh, only a small or limited number of times. Therefore, this is correct and the answer is going to be D. Question number 21. The photomicrograph shows cells at different stages of mitosis. A student wrote four statements about the photomicrograph. Which statements are correct? Now, let's see the statements. One, cell P shows anaphase. Cell P here, we could see that sister chromatids are at opposite poles of the cell, and this is anaphase. This is correct. So basically, the spindle pulls the two sister chromatids apart to the opposite side of the cell. For two, spindle formation is occurring in Q. Now, this is incorrect because Q looks like telophase. And spindle does not form during telophase. Therefore, this is incorrect. 3. The amount of DNA in cell R is the same as in cell T. Now, let's see cell R. Cell R looks like it's happening during prophase. The reason for this is because we could see condensed chromosomes. If we could see the condensed chromosomes, this means that this is prophase. And cell T looks like metaphase because we could see the chromosomes lined across the metaphase equator here. Now, both of these, prophase and metaphase, are during mitosis. And the, the number of DNA in mitosis is always going to be the same. Therefore, this is correct. For the correct order for the stages is S, R, T, P, and Q. So let's see S. S is most likely looks like interface because we do not see condensed chromosomes like prophase and R is going to be prophase yes this is correct then R to T T is metaphase this is correct prophase metaphase and P is anaphase and Q looks like telophase so this is correct P mat therefore the answer is going to be C Question number 22. Bacteria cells with DNA containing only the heavy isotope of nitrogen are allowed to reproduce for three generations in a culture medium containing the normal isotope of nitrogen. Which percentage of DNA molecules produced contains strands of the heavy isotope of nitrogen? Now, let's first look at the diagram that I'm going to draw. Ideally, you should know the percentages, but I'm going to draw the diagram for you and tell you the reasons. Here we're starting for N15 and N15. During the first generation, so the first generation, we are adding N14 to the strands. This means that we're going to have N15, N14, and N15, N14. Therefore, our strands are hybrid, hybrid strands. Therefore, they will contain 100% of heavy isotope because if all the isotopes are hybrid then it means it's 50% light and 50% heavy therefore each strand of this has a heavy chain therefore the first generation is going to have a hundred because all the strands contain one heavy chain of N15 now let's see the second generation for the second generation we're also adding N14 to these strands so here we have N15 N14, 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 N15, N15, and N14, N14. 
is for the second generation. As you can see here, here we have that there's 50% light and 50% hybrid. Therefore, the hybrid strands, as we all know, these are the hybrid strands, contains also nitrogen. Sorry, here it's supposed to be 14. So the hybrid strands also contains heavy nitrogens. Therefore, it's 50-50 in this case, and it's going to be 50% for the second generation. For the third generation, let's draw them out. It's going to be N15, N14, 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 N15, N14, 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 and N14, N14, and N14, N14. Here you can clearly see that we only have two hybrid left out of eight. So two out of eight are hybrid. Therefore, what's going to happen is now we have 25% of hybrid strands which contain heavy isotope of nitrogen available. Therefore, the third generation is going to be 25%. Ideally, you should know the percentages. But here I'm working it out for you to be able to show you the explanation for them. And the answer is going to be C. 23. A bacterial circular DNA molecule is this number base pairs long. 26% of bases are adenine. How many cytosine bases would be in the DNA molecule? Now, if we know that there are going to be 26% of adenine, therefore, as we all know that adenine binds to thymine via complementary base pairing. Therefore, if 26% of AD9 is available, therefore also 26% of thymine is going to be available in these strands. Therefore, we know here the percentages for AD9. 26, thymine, 26. Therefore, we're trying to calculate the percentages for cytosine and guanine. Therefore, what we do is we add 26 plus 26, which would give us 52. And 100 minus 52 is going to give us 48. Now, 48% is the percentage for both cytosine and guanine. To calculate the percentage of only one, we must divide it by two. This would give us 24%. This would give us 24% for cytosine and guanine. Now, it here says how many cytosine bases will be in the DNA molecule. Now, here it says it's 2,600,150 base pairs long, base pairs. This means it's only for one strand. Therefore, what we do is we multiply this number by 2 to calculate for the full DNA molecule. So, if we multiply it by 2, it would give us 5,200,300. Then, we multiply this number by 0.24 or the percentage of cytosine that we just worked out in order to find the percentage of cytosine in the DNA molecule and this would give us C. Question number 24, which statement relating to the structure of DNA is correct? A. Two DNA strands are joined to each other by a phosphodiester bond. Now this is incorrect, nucleotides are joined together by phosphodiester bonds but not the two strands of DNA. The two strands of DNA join with the nitrogenous bases via hydrogen bonds, via hydrogen bonding, not by phosphodiester bonds. Therefore, this is incorrect for B. The alignment of bases to form a double helix is only achieved between anti-parallel strands. Now, this is correct because as we all know, we have a five prime strand to three prime and an anti-parallel one would be three prime to five prime. This is how they align together. Therefore, this is correct. And this is the only way the double helix is achieved because they bind together by complementary base pairing, both strands. Therefore, this is correct C. Three hydrogen bonds are formed between all base pairs containing purines. Now, purines are adenine and guanine. 
Now, when E-D9 binds to thymine, it binds via two hydrogen bonds. And E-D9 is a purine. So this is correct. It doesn't bind by three hydrogen bonds. It binds by two. So this is incorrect. D. The number of cytosine bases always equals the number of thymine bases. This is incorrect. The number of cytosine bases would equal the number of guanine. Not thymine. Therefore, this is incorrect and the answer is going to be B. Question number 25. A student sketched the diagram to represent the process of transcription. Which part of their diagram shows the non-transcribed strand? So, here the transcribed strand is the one which the mRNA molecule binds to or forms on. So, here is the mRNA molecule. And this is the transcribed strand and this is where they're binding. So, this is the transcribed strand. Now, the one opposite to the transcribed strand is going to be the non-transcribed. Or this is the non-template strand. So the one that the mRNA binds to is the template and the one opposite is the non-template strand or the non-transcribed strand. Therefore, the answer is going to be A. Question number 26, which row is correct for the movement of water in a root? Now we have two pathways, we have the apoplast and the symplast. For the apoplast, water moves through cell walls of these cells without actually entering inside the cell, which is faster. Contrasting symplast. Symplast is when the water enters the actual cell by osmosis into the vacuole and passes through the cell through the plasmodesmata. Therefore, simplast is the slowest because it, it requires the most friction. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. A. Apoplast pathway through intercellular spaces. Now, as we said, apoplast pathway does occur through intracellular spaces or through cell walls, outside of cells. Now, molecule present in Casparian strip. As we all know, Casparian strip is waterproof and does not let water through by apoplast pathway. It only lets water through by symplast. Therefore, it has a waterproof material called subrin. So, subrin is correct. Now, for B, apoplast pathway through the plasmodesmata. This is incorrect because we just mentioned that apoplast does not enter through the cell. And the one that enters through the plasmodesmata is the symplast. So, this is incorrect. For C, symplast pathway through the plasmodesmata. This one is correct, but it's the lignin which is incorrect. It's actually subrin. Therefore, the answer is going to be A. Seven, the table contains some information about uptake and movement of water and of mineral ions in plants. Using the information provided, which factors will affect the uptake and movement of water or of the mineral ions in plants? Now, let's start with the humidity. Humidity, yes, will alter the rate of uptake of water because here, evaporation rate is actually reduced by increasing humidity, so humidity is definitely correct. Now, two, surface area of root hair cell. And by the way, here it says water or mineral ions. Now, surface area of root hair cell. Yes, this is correct. It affects the rate of water uptake because the higher surface area of the root hair cell, the higher the rate of water uptake. Same with mineral ions. It provides a higher surface area. Therefore, two is also correct. Part three, oxygen concentration. Oxygen concentration is correct. It will affect the rate of uptake of mineral ions only, not the water. The reason for this is, as we all know, mineral ions enters the root hair cell by active transport. And this active transport requires ATP. Therefore, if the oxygen concentration decreased, this means that there is less respiration. If there is less respiration, there is less ATP produced. And the rate of active transport decreases. Therefore, oxygen concentration does alter the rate of uptake. Now, for four, temperature. As we all know, temperature alters the rate of evaporation of the water. Therefore, it's correct and the answer is going to be A. Question number 28, which changes to the water potential and the volume of solution in the flowing sieve tube occur when sucrose is moved from a photosynthesizing leaf into the flowing sieve tube? Now, what happens is that sucrose from companion cells diffuses through the plasmodesmata into the phloem sieve tube. Therefore, what happens 
is that the water potential inside the phloem sieve tube becomes lower. The water potential decreases because now there's an increased solute concentration or sucrose concentration. Therefore, what happens because there's an increased sucrose concentration adjacent cells, what happens is that water moves from adjacent cells by osmosis down water potential gradient into the phloem sieve tube element. So what happens is that the volume of the solution increases because water is moving in by osmosis. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be lower water potential as we mentioned why, and the volume increases, so the answer is going to be D. Question number 29, a student wrote the following statements about possible mechanism for loading sucrose from a source. Which statements are correct? So let's quickly outline the process of loading sucrose. Now, here is a companion cell. And here is a phloem sieve tube element. So what happens is the companion cell starts by pumping hydrogen ions to its cell wall. Now, against concentration gradient, this process is active and it requires ATP. So pumping hydrogen ions by proton pumps requires ATP. Now, once this happens, there is a higher concentration of hydrogen ions to the cell wall in the cell wall of companion cell. Therefore, what happens is that the pH decreases. Now, what happens is that sucrose goes in back into the companion cell with a hydrogen ion through something called a co-transporter protein by facilitated diffusion. And the sucrose is now inside the companion cell. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. One, when energy is released from ATP, the release energy is used to move sucrose through a co-transporter protein. Now, we just said it moves into the companion cell by facilitated diffusion. Therefore, this is incorrect. Two, as sucrose is moved into a companion cell, the pH in the cell wall of the companion cell decreases. Now, this is a bit complicated to understand, but as the proton pumps are pumping hydrogen ions outside the companion cell, this means that there's a higher concentration of hydrogen outside. Therefore, the pH decreases. Now, as sucrose enters the companion cell, so moved into companion cell, more hydrogen ions are pumped outside. Therefore, what happens is that the pH decreases. Therefore, this is correct. Three, proton pumps in the cell membrane of a companion cell move sucrose into flow and sieve tube elements. Now, proton pump is not what moves sucrose into sieve tube elements. It actually moves by diffusion through the plasmodesmata. By normal passive diffusion, this does not require ATP, neither proton pumps. Therefore, this is incorrect and the correct answer is going to be D. Question number 30. The diagram shows a transverse section through an artery. Which tissues are present in layer X? So layer X is the tunica intima and the mnemonic to remember what's in the tunica intima is going to be CES. So CES, C for collagen, E for elastic fibers, and S for smooth muscle. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be D. Question number 31, what is systolic blood pressure? Now let's start with A, the blood pressure in the arteries when the heart is relaxing. Relaxing is incorrect, this is the diastolic pressure. Now this is stolic. B. The blood pressure in the left ventricle at the start. Okay, the blood pressure in the left ventricle is the ventricular pressure. Not the systolic pressure, so this is incorrect. C. The maximum blood pressure in the arteries. Now this is correct. It's the maximum blood pressure in the arteries. Now for D. The maximum blood pressure in the right ventricle. Also. This is ventricular pressure. Therefore, this is incorrect. For this question, you must work by elimination. Therefore, the answer is going to be C. Question number 32. The diagram shows pressure changes in the left side of the heart and aorta over time. What is the total time during one cardiac cycle that the atrioventricular valves and the semilunar valves are both closed at the same time? Now, a really important mnemonic to remember is COCO. So here, close, open, close, open. 
and in the area above here we're looking at the semilunar valve give me a moment and i'll explain why so semilunar valve is two and three and one and four at the bottom we're looking at the atrioventricular valve this is how to interpret any graph that looks like this now why did i say close open close open here as we could see for the atrioventricular valve at one is closed the reason for this is because here there is the left atrium the line for the left atrium as you can see the line for the left atrium is decreasing therefore this means that the atrium pressure is decreasing if the atrial pressure is decreasing this means that it can no longer move or push the atrioventricular valve open therefore it closes now for two here we're talking about the semilunar valve the reason for this is we could see the aortic pressure line and the left the pressure in the left ventricle so as the pressure in the left ventricle increases this means that there's enough pressure to push the semilunar valve open therefore at two it opens now let's see here which periods are both the semilunar and the atrioventricular valve both closed now this region is going to be between one and two the period between one and two is where both of them are closed same with three and four so let's draw the faint lines here the reason for this is the area before four has the atrioventricular valve actually closed so here the in this area the atrioventricular valve is also closed same as the semilunar valve and the area also between one and two has the semilunar valve open sorry i mean closed therefore we must calculate the times here you could see it's 0 0.03 for this area and it's going to be 0 0.04 by adding them together you're going to have 0.07 seconds and the answer is going to be c question number 33 which reactions take place in the capillaries surrounding an alveolus one carbon dioxide combining with water forming carbonic acid now carbon dioxide combining with water forming carbonic acid occurs in muscle cells where there is a high rate of respiration and carbon dioxide is a product of respiration same with two it occurs in muscle cells not in the lungs therefore both of these are incorrect for three hemoglobinic acid dissociates into hemoglobin and hydrogen ions this is correct this happens in the alveolus the reason for this is now the hemoglobin is free to combine with oxygen forming oxyhemoglobin so this is correct for hydrogen carbonate ions combining with hydrogen ions forming carbonic acid and therefore carbon dioxide and water this does happen in the alveolus in the lungs the reason for this is so that carbon dioxide can be excreted by the lung therefore three and four is the correct answer and is going to be b question number 34 which statement explains the importance of the chloride shift in red blood cells now what is the chloride shift it's new in the syllabus this year and the chloride shift is basically when carbonic acid dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions what happens is that the bicarbonate ions leaves the red blood cells to the plasma then what happens is if that kept happening then the cell would have an overall positive charge thus we need to balance the electronegativity we balance the electronegativity by chlorine ions which have a negative charge entering the red blood cell this is basically the chloride shift now for A, carbon dioxide diffuses from blood plasma into red blood cell and chloride ions diffuse out of red blood cell to maintain a balance of positive and negative ions. As we said, carbon dioxide has nothing to do with this. It's to do with bicarbonate ions and chlorine ions. For B, hydrogen carbonate ions diffuse into plasma from red blood cells. So this is correct. We said that hydrogen carbonate ions leaves the plasma or bicarbonate. 
and chloride ions diffuse into red blood cell yes we just mentioned that to maintain a balance of positive and negative ions this is correct and the answer is going to be B. question number 35 the photomicrograph shows a cross section through the lining of part of the respiratory system which statements about the photomicrographs are correct one red blood cells are visible between squamous epithelium cells now here we could only see ciliated epithelium cells because all of them have cilia there is no cell which does not have cilia therefore we cannot see goblet cells because goblet cells do not have cilia and all of them have cilia so this is incorrect two smooth muscle is visible of course smooth muscle is visible under the cartilage so this is the cartilage under the cartilage is the smooth muscle so this is correct three the section cannot be from a bronchiole as cartilage is visible this is also correct because bronchioles do not have cartilage and we just said that we have a huge block of cartilage here therefore the answer is going to be d question number 36 the surface tension of the layer of liquid lining the alveoli tends to pull the walls inwards so alveoli could collapse which statements could explain how this is prevented so the surface tension occurs by hydrogen bonding because in the alveoli water molecules in the alveoli has a tendency to hydrogen bond together to form hydrogen bonds together if this actually happens then the alveoli would suddenly just collapse then this is prevented by something called pulmonary surfactant what it does it basically separates water molecules from each other so they don't bind together by hydrogen bonding so one alveolar fluid is moved around by cilia it has nothing to do with cilia it's only primarily by pulmonary surfactant two elastic fibers keep the alveoli open this is incorrect they only stretch and recoil three epithelial cells secrete a chemical that reduces the cohesion in water this is correct the chemical is pulmonary surfactant and therefore the answer is going to be d Question number 37, what will reduce the rate at which bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? 1. Prescribing two antibiotics with different modes of action. This is correct, because if one mode of action did not work, then hopefully the other will. Therefore, this reduces the resistance. Therefore, this is correct to prescribing different antibiotics for the same bacteria. This makes it more likely that all bacteria is dying and none of them reproduce again. So this is correct 3. Finishing a prescribed course of antibiotics. Now this is correct. Finishing the course to the end makes sure and ensure that all bacteria is dead. Therefore, the answer is going to be A. Question number 38. T-lymphocytes have a protein PD-1 on their surface. Some cancer cells have a receptor molecule on their surface which binds to PD-1. So cancer cells have a receptor. Let's assume this is a cancer cell has a receptor which binds to PD-1 on T lymphocytes in activating the T lymphocyte so not allowing the T lymphocyte to kill the cancer cell a monoclonal antibody has been produced against this receptor what may have correctly concluded from this information one the monoclonal antibody binds with a receptor on the surface of skin cancer cells this is correct binds to the receptor inhibiting it so inhibiting it so this is correct so cancer cells to which the monoclonal antibody is bound cannot inactivate t lymphocytes obviously this is correct because if cancer cells bound to these receptors they cannot inactivate the pd1 proteins on t lymphocytes therefore they cannot inactivate the t lymphocytes three the monoclonal antibody targets and kills skin cancer cells no, this is incorrect. As we said, it inhibits the protein on the cancer cell or the receptor on the cancer cell. And then the body's immune system or the T lymphocyte is what actually goes now and is able to kill the cancer cell because that receptor is no longer available. So this is incorrect for the monoclonal antibody allows a patient's own immune system to kill the cancer cells. This is correct by stopping the inhibition of the cancer cell to that protein therefore the correct answer must be 
Question number 39. A person's blood group is determined by antigens present on red blood cells. The table shows the antigens and antibodies in the blood of people with different blood groups. During a blood transfusion, it is essential that the person receiving the blood does not have antibodies to the donor's blood. Which blood group can be given to a person with a blood group AB? So here, the person receiving the blood, okay, so the person AB does not have antibodies to the donor's blood. Donor's blood could be any one of those. So here, if you look at AB, it does not actually have antibodies to anything. It says neither. Therefore, all blood groups are able to donate to AB. Therefore, D is going to be the correct answer. Question number 40, which types of cell are stimulated to divide by cytokines produced by T helper cells? Let's see, so macrophage, this is incorrect. B, B lymphocytes only, this is also incorrect. C, T killer cells only, it's not only T killer cells. D, B lymphocytes and T killer cells, so this is correct. Once the antigen binds to a complementary B cell receptor, the cytokines produced stimulates the B cells to divide by mitosis. Same with T killer cells, therefore the answer is going to be D. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you think this channel offers you any value, I'd highly appreciate if you would subscribe and like this video.